Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Film Concussion with Borough, Carlson, and Powers. This week's films, Gremlins and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Yes, this week uh, we get to look at movies that are important to, I guess, film history and also not so kind to Asians. <laughs> um, so if that's your cup of tea, you are in for a treat. And usually the, the, the doom comes at a very shady kind of deal where they make a false deal with you. Like, um, you know, mm -hmm. buying a mogwai, for example. Referred to as the bait and switch tactic. Right. Um, Climbing so your we best titled... friend is an elephant. Right. <laughs> Um, so we titled this episode our PG-13 episodes because these movies are widely believed to have started the rating of PG-13, and it's probably because of the influence of someone like Steven Spielberg. These films in particular are did kind of tread that water of violence versus kind of tongue-in-cheek violence. Especially, let's we get started off with Gremlins here, um, because sure. Gremlins, uh, you know, if you haven't seen, most of you have probably seen it, you know, like, so... I can't tell you how many, when I was, when I was, uh, you know, in high school, middle school, and all that stuff, stuff how many people said gremlins scared them shitless when they were little kids and they first saw it yeah i mean it scared, it, it the crap scared out me. Of me and i was pretty unshakable as a child you don't get to see little monsters done very well um a lot because it's usually kind of like critters and just kind of stupid um you could do big monsters pretty good like alien and shit well um, gremlins but basically started a whole trend in like, you know, this, and then Critters came out and whatever yeah, that one yeah, yeah. with the ghoulies, all that <laughs> yeah, stuff. Yeah, the ghoulies. <laughs> yeah, God, um, God bless Roger Corman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, then they made a sequel, which is yeah. Gremlins Take Manhattan. Oh boy, I'm scared over here. The, you notice that the tongue-in-cheek level in the second one is a lot more. Like, there's a lot more kind of, it kind of shifts reality, like Hulk Hogan shows yeah. up. And, all the you know, Gremlins like, get superpowers. They yeah, like, yeah, they um, break the fourth wall and yeah and it plainly it it almost seems like it's a parody of the first film in some ways yeah and that's that's what's that's what's so weird about the second one is that this one kind of played more like a horror movie than it did kind of for a family movie i mean the gremlins did some wacky shit and they were pretty cute you know and and lord knows we all love gizmo yeah. and stripe I mean, it's not that even the second one toned down on the, like, kind of alien gore that's in it. I mean, you know, they put the Kremlin through a paper shredder in the second one. Mm. Um, that violence was a lot more playful than the violence in this one. Yeah. Like, this movie really did kind of warp my perception of the door songs, I'm Gonna Love You. Mm -hmm. You know, like, because they're playing, and it's just, like, and Christmas music in general, too. Like, yeah. I, yeah, like I, it's really well, creepy. It's like when Alex sings <laughs> Singing in the Rain and Clockwork Orange. Well, right. I mean, as a child, it made me fucking terrified to put anything in a mailbox. It was like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, um, if they ever made a third Gremlins, uh -huh. which since Hollywood's really into doing that these days, if they ever made a third Gremlins, say goodbye to the Muppets. You know, like the Muppets are gone. It'll all be all CGI. It'll all look really shitty. Also, the, the tongue-in-cheek playfulness that was, you know, kind of grown exponentially in the second one will be, again, exponentially grown in a third one. So I, I think that it'll just be it'll just be a complete cartoon of itself and not even kind of try to be scary. Like people falling down and like a zoink noise yeah. and yeah, mm -hmm, like you know. wacky gremlins, you know, like a Catherine Heigl movie. Well, I mean, it, it it could be really weird. They could go the other extreme too, because I've noticed that happens as well. Like uh, with Smurfs, where it's like, like a, you know, fairly yeah. Smurfs is real like, dark. Yeah. The, the Smurfs, yeah. it's a darker, grittier version of the Smurfs. <laughs> it's like, why are they in the big city? Why are they almost getting run over? Like that wouldn't have happened in the old Smurf cartoon. <laughs> Why do like, they have to take down a serial killer? Well, I, I think this... <laughs> <laughs> Which turns out to be Kevin Spacey and the drive in the middle of the field. Oh, God. <laughs> See, you know. Yeah, he delivers a very small box. <laughs> What's smurfing in the box? <laughs> but, you know, like, but that's okay. But that's, but I, I think Smurfs is a bit different. People who watch the Smurfs cartoons are getting much, much older in the disconnect between the younger people is getting much, much wider that Smurfs kind of had to throw them in Manhattan to kind of throw them in reality, you know, kind of, and they're going to, I think they're going to have to do that for the Muppets too, um, in a certain way, um, but I think the Muppets is a little bit different. Well, you know, I saw the trailer for the Muppets movie and I'm actually like, against my better judgment, I'm actually a little excited for it. Like, I, and I know that yeah, it's me that too. ridiculous. Yeah, me too. Like, the level of talent yeah. that they've got in it, like the fact that Jason Segel wrote the screenplay and that they got Brett from fucking Flight of the Concords writing the songs and stuff. And that guy's oh, hilarious. Cool. I didn't know well, that. Well, the, um, director, the director from Flight of the Concords is also directing the movie. Like, the wow. guy who actually directed the show is huh. doing that movie. I mean, it's huh. just a big musical number is kind of what they're doing. But, it looks uh, like it's going to be a lot of fun. I would definitely say that in terms of Gremlins, I think most people I know who are our age and even older remember it fondly and still, I mean, 
I would rewatch Gremlins for not this sometime. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. I loved Gremlins. Or I still Smurfs, do. I even like the second I'm never going to watch the Smurfs again. Oh, probably. no. I'm... But it, but it also seems like Gremlins, for some reason, like some of the character details they put into it are things that they couldn't get away with doing now. How do you mean? Well, the girl recounts her father dying. Oh, yeah. That's a weird you know? part. That's like really intense story about her father being dead in the chimney. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that, yeah. That, that would not happen in a modern film. I don't think they would ever pull the gloves off that yeah, much. Yeah, Phoebe like, Cates plays that part. Yeah, like right. the super sweet 16 brats we have now have never been smacked around like that by a storyteller, you know? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, just... it's all about Edward loves you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> don't. <Nope. laughs> no, uh, no grim story about finding her father dead in the chimney. <laughs> oh, that would liven up that. You know what? That would liven up that movie. It would be right up next to the. Uh, tear into her uterus to give birth. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I can't wait to see how they're going to handle that. Um, but uh, I, I was obsessed with this movie when I was a little kid. Gremlins, not Twilight. Um, no. uh-huh. And I especially loved the theme song. Me Word. and my friend would always hum the theme song, like, on the uh-huh. way home from school. It's both the movies we're discussing today have awesome theme songs. Didn't Danny Elfman do the theme that... Nah, 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 nah. You might have. I think it was Danny Elfman. Chris, didn't you say you saw a movie recently that reminded you of Gremlins in some fashion? I've seen a film recently that surprised me because while the CGI itself was just a horrible monstrosity, it still managed to tell an interesting story with a character and made it very kind of evocative of different emotions. Uh, it was Rise of the Planet of the Apes, which sure, I've heard that. I did not think a talking monkey movie was going to be worth my time, and I was actually like dragging my feet. I don't want to see the movie, and then everybody kept telling me it was so good that I eventually was like, all right. I'll give this a shot. Wow, Borf. I mean, I think on this show, you and I have kind of, like, kind of poked fun at that movie existing. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah, Before I knew anything about the movie, I had just seen, like, the TV spots, and then I went and saw a movie, and they played the full theatrical trailer. And it did so that there was, like, oh, wait, there's actually this whole story behind Caesar. You've got, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a dimension-ridden John Lithgow. What's not to love? Well, I mean, and that's that's, that's (laughs) interesting that you actually bring that that film up, too, because, like, I, you know, like, because Gizmo's the main character in Gremlins. He's the Mm -hmm. hero. He's the guy... And you think about the time, too, they, like, the animatronics, we all love Gizmo. He's adorable, and we like his voice, and mm-hmm. we really want him to be a pet. Yeah, Howie Damn Mandel. the consequences. Yeah, yeah. Howie Mantel. <laughs> um, that's interesting, too, because, like, I think that's... But I, I really don't think you could repeat Gizmo's kind of expressions through CGI. I think it'll look just, like, kind of weird and alien. Uh, I, I feel like if they made the movie nowadays, all the gremlins would be CGI. Gizmo probably be CGI. Unless they were just trying to do a retro thing. The the cool part about, like, even the second one where he's, you know, turning into Rambo. In 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 this this one, he's the hero almost just by happenstance because he had the opportunity to do something because he's small and the gremlins weren't paying attention to him. Uh, in the second one, he dresses up like Rambo. <laughs> yeah. So, it, but, that's why I don't want to know what they'd do in a third one. In the third one, they'd make him, like, ninja and Gizmo and shit. I'll reserve my opinion on it because it could be done really well because I mean you have surprises like I said with Rise of the Planet of the Apes I sat through the Tim Burton piece of shit I've seen like I've seen the original you've seen what they can do to it I saw the original Rise of the Planet of the Apes where it was just a bunch of people running around in stupid suits with rubber faces like I I get that it could be really dumb I think it has more to do with how much of a characterization they put into the creature I think that's a big step towards making it believable I mean it's the same thing with like uh, Pixar like you you have to you have to take that journey with Pixar like all right, we're talking about a desk lamp here but it still has personality but that's a little different because those are CGI characters in a CGI world. Even watching movies like this or The Thing now, the practical effects are just so... I miss them in a lot of ways. They're really yeah. charming, and they don't take me... I mean, you could tell a CG effect from a mile away, and it may be able to do slightly more, but it still has that look, that little shine that doesn't belong in this world. That makes that's it real. It. Yeah. And, you know, even just talking about just what well, we can move into the Temple of Doom now, I really do love all the Indiana Jones films. I think, like... Really, all of them are fantastic spectacles of action and suspense. And considering the technology in which those things were made, it's still a pretty good romp and does rival Maybe a lot Crystal of... Maybe Crystal Skull is a little... Well, no, I, I... Okay, perhaps I shouldn't say every Indiana Jones movie, but at least, I, I you know, what Indiana Jones, what? I, I blacked out what happened. I'm um, so... What, <laughs> uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Uh, the second one in the trilogy. First chronologically. Ah, uh, really? Oh, yeah. uh, that's... I remember yeah. that now. This that's one takes right. place before Raiders. Huh. Yeah. I didn't yeah, know Yeah, and that. wasn't it like uh, the third one was supposed to be the very first one chronologically? Wasn't no, I think the third of... one takes place after this. 
this. This one is mid 30s before the Nazis were really a thing. Yeah, and, and it's the second one, so it's got to be darker. Yep. You know, gotta, and it's gotta, the gotta, only gotta one to not feature the classic evil villain Nazis, and instead has a cult. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, Mola Rum. <laughs> I mean, I I really do love the Temple of Doom. I think this is really one of my favorite Indiana Jones. It was actually my first one that I ever watched, and it did. It's this move. This one scared the piss out of me. Like Mola Rum did scare me. Um, but I think that that's all his purpose was in this yeah. film, and that's what makes him, like, the weakest of the Bond villains. Because even, like, Raiders, you had, you know, you had his rival, and then even in the third one, you know, Julian Glover, like, kind of sends him off on this mission and then turns out stabbing in the back. This one, you're kind of introduced to Mola Rum, like, after we've already done this thing with Lao Che. Like, that's who I yeah. thought the bad guy was. You know, I thought it was that guy. And then, like, we move into this completely other country, um, and 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 we meet Mola Rum, who, who is, Does you know, he show up before uh, he pulls the dude's heart out at all? No. 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 Nope. No, not I was, even, I was not even to mentioned. Just <laughs> determine if he was at the dinner or anything, pretending to be a normal dude, but I don't I don't think he was. No, right. no. He just abruptly shows up like, "Well, taking out a dude's heart." <laughs> yeah. I'm I used gonna to be your villain. in uh, in back in the day, I used to have this idea for a shirt I wanted to make. Uh, he says Kali Ma when he takes out his someone's heart. <laughs> uh -huh. I always Kali wanted a shirt that said Kali Mari, and it's a picture of Mola Ram in front of a tank full of squid <laughs> trying to pull <laughs> one out. Uh, oh, yeah, I always wanted to make a shirt out of that. Uh, my other my other shirt idea was uh, Harrison Ford Theater, which is uh, <laughs> which is uh, Han Solo shooting uh, Abraham Lincoln with a blaster under the table. <laughs> oh, you know, oh that, boy! It's, it's, you would make a million dollars if you made that shirt. You know what's so weird about about Harrison Ford is that all most he has a lot of iconic roles, but a good majority of them are Lucas slash Spielberg True. Um, yeah. creations. Um, I always found that interesting. You know, like I. I I just, there's, I can't think of a, another actor that's really gone through that. Those were the only two guys that seemed to know how to use him as a star. Because he tried branching out in other things, and like, you know, he has Blade Runner and things like that, but it, you know, as good as Blade Runner is, he's really poorly cast, and it seems like Ridley Scott didn't know what to do with him. So I'd say that it seems like, you know, these guys all came from a similar background, so I think they were all kind of in on what, you know, he was doing and why he was there. They're, they're a powerful group to be among with, uh, be in with, um, and if you are uh, Steven Spielberg's wife, you get to be the worst love interest in an Indiana Jones movie uh, by I know. far. And and, and she's just awful. Oh, my yeah. God. I'll, well, like, it's, it's because he fell in love with her while making this. And that's sweet, I guess. But Yeah, but it's still pretty cloying because you're just listening <laughs> to it and you're like, oh, Jesus. Like, like we said, this is this is a prequel. Uh, and by the time Raiders came around, he had ditched her and for a reason. <laughs> Because he left India? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not like he's with her because, like, he's going anywhere. He's stuck with her, you know? Yeah. So you feel like you're stuck with her, too. I am with Russell in that I think this is an underrated movie. I like it more than The Last Crusade, though I like Raiders a little better. Um, but it is, I mean, Willie is a terrible character, and it is racist as it gets in a lot of the yeah. parts. Oh, oh look yeah. at these monkey brain eaten Indians. <laughs> Even as a kid, that kind of got me, because I'm like, um... If they're from India, isn't it more likely that they're all going to be vegetarian than anything else? Like, wh where would they get these monkeys to eat their brains anyway? Aren't those... I don't know if they have them everywhere. But, uh, <laughs> just like, it's just across the board, just sort of like evil Asian stereotypes. Like, you know, since India is kind of part of Asia. Like, even Short Round is just like... Oh, know, come on now. But you Fuck gotta off. love Short no, Round. No, come on. Bullshit. Short no. Round is the man any way you look at him. They made Short Round the man. And I had made it nothing... It, they made him the man having nothing to do with the fact that he was Asian. Yeah, so, no. Was bullshit. Awesome. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. He was mm -hmm. Asian, and he happened to be Asian. And, yeah, he has the Asian accent. nothing in his but... characters... Ever did anything that the brought up the fact. Dude. Let me ask you a follow-up question. What's the limit on exotic stereotypes in these films to which you would stop enjoying it? Because I know that in 1930s serials, it tends to be that they always have some sort of stereotype in the background that can either be the villain when it's a uh, sure. convenient. I think it was, yeah, or with the villain, like with this one more so than Short Round. And even mm -hmm. Loud Shea in a bit. Or, in, or in, in fact, I mean, almost any Indian in the movie was... Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> a, little, a little sketch. But, yeah. uh, but I mean, it's true of kind of any 1930s serials. They tended to always have some sort of a weird group that was either exotic and fun to be around or exotic and evil. So mm -hmm. it was like, you know, you have Indians in or Native Americans in 
cowboy westerns sure. or in these films you have you know either the exotic chinese or the evil devious chinese and towards world war ii it was always the evil japanese and things yeah. like that i kind of wonder if that wasn't part of the reason that the crystal skull had serious problems because they couldn't figure out anyone who would be a convincing villain and frankly we have nothing yeah, against you know, the russians the, the, anymore at the time these films came out we had nothing with the nazis yeah i mean yeah we don't have a problem with germany today i think in the crystal skull they really could have made that really cool with the communists i think that really kind of could have been cool if they made him sort of like more of a spy thing went off to stupid alien land and that's what made that movie shitty yeah, it had well, nothing to do with the, like the convincing villain it's just the mm -hmm. fact that the fucking villain was lousy aliens that was the magic uh, yeah his territory is definitely in more the supernatural than the extraterrestrial and that was a big problem with that movie even though at the beginning of every new movie he's like oh, i don't believe in all that hocus pocus despite seeing crazy shit all the time <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> Jones. Hey, he's just got a really, really high standard. He's like, well, that was crazy, but it well, wasn't that crazy. That could have just been a crazy light show. Yeah. You know, you, he you, got you, spontaneously old because of a disease. <laughs> I think actually Temple of Doom is actually the least magic other than a guy ripping out his guy's heart. I mean, like Raiders of the Lost Ark was way more kind well, of Well, they have like... that brainwash thing. Oh, that's true. Yeah, 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 yeah all yeah. right, all right. That's true. Good point, good point. All right, well said. This to me is the perfect adventure movie. Die Hard's an action movie, but this is an adventure kind of movie. And it gets once it gets going, I like this, this movie just doesn't stop. Like you just go from like the guy getting the heart ripped out and then he's brainwashed and let's do this crazy stuff. And then there's a mine car chase and then they're on the bridge. It's just kind of <laughs> nonstop after a certain point it kind of starts that whole way through though because i mean it's like they start off in like such random things like they're True. in like a, a hong kong nightclub and then they're suddenly yeah. in a plane and then they're jumping out of a plane with an inflatable raft and then landing in water True. that somehow gets yeah. them to where the rest of the and then there's, there's a little bit of a break there for a minute when they get to the palace russell you once said that whenever you hear the curb your enthusiasm theme no matter what you're doing you feel like you know um a moron or a putz or something that's just kind of right yeah like, this go. is the exact opposite anytime i hear the indiana jones theme whatever i'm doing i feel like a goddamn hero you're, you're <laughs> just driving yeah, amen to that brother if that indiana jones theme is playing in my car i'm like i am awesome this is the coolest many, thing yeah. anyone has ever done i am cleaning the fuck out of these dishes yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. many many a, many a work day hauling pallets of food would have started out with that song and i could do anything surprisingly um, though uh you can't play it in the bedroom the ladies do not dig it <laughs> <laughs> Does not set the mood. You think they it don't would. get it? They don't get it. So don't you understand Russell, what I'm doing right now? Take off that hat and put away the whip. We're not doing that tonight. Listen, what kind no. of lady does not want to get with Indiana Jones? Come on. You know that's a fair point. Hey, I, I need to. I need to get into your Ark of the Covenant, lady. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and it better not be full of sand like the one in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> or turn me into, or melt me at the yeah, sight of God. That would not. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, that, I guess, about wraps us up on the Temple of Doom. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, Indiana uh, Jones-themed romance. I'll pull right. your heart out. <laughs> I guess that, that makes it time for the uh, Heads Up question. Yeah, Zach Powers, and, you were on the pitching uh, mound. This week, I'm, uh, I'm uh, taking the blood on that one. George Lucas, since, you know, we're talking about him, uh, is once again revamping uh, Return of the Jedi, which we recently watched, including adding nose to the climactic scene where he throws the Emperor yeah. down, I don't know, a chute of some kind. And um, I was going to ask you guys if going back and revamping old work is ever acceptable, if it's the artist's right, or if it could ever make something better. I know that I know that when we did the show, I actually went out of my way to not watch the new versions, just because it was such a, like, when we did the whole trilogy. I think sure. I screwed up on one of them, and I had to sit through, like, the CGI monsters. Yeah. yeah, me too. It's one of those things that I just tried really, really hard not to see them. And, I mean, it's... Right, and it goes back to what we were talking about with practical effects versus CGI. I don't think that um, any of the stuff he's added has particularly helped. Um, I think a lot of it has just been a guy as he ages uh, trying to... Recapture glory? Recapture Fortune glory. and glory? Or it's the problem that he's just old and he has kids now, and he yeah. suddenly is feeling pangs of responsibility that he didn't feel when he was younger and he was just making these films. So he's trying to do all these extra things. Plus that, it's also he's just trying to make more money. Yeah, that's the true. level of revisionist that George Lucas is, I have a hard time calling him an artist. Um, because... Name me something he's done after Star Wars and Indiana Jones. Howard yeah. the Duck. Oh, yeah, good good call there. Howard the Duck. Boy, howdy. That 
Great. But Spielberg's not innocent of he the E.T. revision. That's kind of famous where he replaced all the guns with radios. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. that's and I, you know like and Spielberg. I I always wanted to kind of give him more credit until he came out with uh, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Mm. I was like, ah, uh, you know, he's not that bad. You know, like changing him to guns. I get it. You know, like making it for the kids, and it never really. It always was supposed to be a kids movie, and I guess we're scared of guns mm. now. When Indiana Jones and the Kingdom, that one was just I uh, that was unforgivable. Well, that was to me. just a bad movie. Yeah. It's kind of been on the out for a while now, though. Like, a lot of his films have not been up to that par. Uh, some of them have been, like, really great that I know Spielberg can be, but some of them have been, you know, exhaustingly terrible. Mm. Like, Lost Munich, World. I didn't... The Lost okay, World was yeah. exhausting Lost World, terrible. War I mean, he made some okay ones yeah, after I mean, that, but Jesus. Right, but, like, yeah. catch me if you and can. Him and, him and Tom Hanks are still doing their World War II love affair thing. But I always felt like... Um, once a, once a movie kind of came out, once it was out in the ether, I know it's kind of a cliche thing to say, but it kind of belongs to the people at that point. And it always felt like a cheat to me to go back and try and fix it or change it or revise it. Yeah. I mean, because it is, it's what people know, it's what they've experienced, and it's, you know, it's a part of their lives as much as it is, you know, maybe not quite as much as it is the creators, but it, to a big degree for a lot of people. Uh, have you guys actually seen the scene yet or no? Oh, I haven't seen it. I only read about it. Oh, uh, I have. I watched it on uh, YouTube. It's just... Like when the emperor's frying him, he says no and all that jazz. But uh, clearly a tie into the other one. Yeah, but the problem I've seen in it is I don't think that there's any way that Vader can ever yell effectively because every time he yells, it's like a guy in a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's like you know like imagine anyone. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. like anybody angrily yelling in a bucket. Like, you yeah. just can't take or, it seriously. Or a guy uh, yelling in a refrigerator after a nuclear blast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no reason why he should be yelling. Yeah, it's not even like the actor isn't even doing anything to suggest he is yelling. He's just... Yeah, because you can't right. because he's wearing a fucking mask. You, he, you know... Why is that change needed? Were people confused as to why he... Can, <laughs> I, I don't understand. Uh -huh. Like, I thought it was pretty clear. Oh, my son is being tortured. I guess I'll kill the guy who's torturing him. Don't need to vocalize that. It's pretty obvious. But I, yeah, guess, yeah, yeah. I guess it wasn't. I guess he thought that all the reasons why all of us nerds love Star Wars is because we kept having so many questions about it so he wanted to answer make sure that we walked away from star wars with absolutely no questions yeah. they're just taking these classic films and they're putting on the kids mittens to deal with all these tiny children now no, growing well, up to be super that, sweet dude. 16 that, why, you know, our poor children not the children what will they do difficult. a lot of entertainment is I mean, Jersey Shore isn't exactly, you know, Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. But it's popular. Yeah, and, and that's why I could say to button off the episode, we have the PG-13 rating, folks. Yes, so we do. thanks, thanks to all you 13-year-olders. I'm glad you get to start your first day of high school tomorrow. The Junior um, Film Concussion Squad. Yes. <laughs> Listening out there. Uh, <laughs> You know, don't worry, in, a, in, a, in, in four more years, you'll be able to see a rated R movie. Barton Fink, Barton Fink. Technically, Fink. they're too young to download our podcast. <laughs> it's got oh, that's right. Oh, label. Good. <laughs> well, in case you're smart enough to, to hack Dad's account, which naughty boy you. <laughs> um, uh, so that should probably wrap us up. Let's go ahead and um, break the monkey head on this one and get it done. Uh, <laughs> We are watching next week Grizzly Man and Piranha 3D. Oh, when animals attack. Yeah, uh. we want to keep it as classy as possible. <laughs> so, as usual, uh, we had a lot of new members join. Uh, welcome, everybody. And if you'd like to chat with us, go ahead and hit us up on Facebook. As always, subscribe to us on iTunes and whatnot, you know, like, and write us a review if you love us. Write it on strippers if they happen to get close <laughs> enough. <laughs> so, this is Borof signing off from L.A. And Carlson from New York City. And from a darkened MPAA rating room, this is Name Withheld. <laughs> powers, it's Powers. Valima. Valima. Valima Shakti De. Bali Chadhao Tere Aage.